Dunkley. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, before I speak on this motion, I just wanted to say that I caught the end of the member for Sturt's contribution on the member for MacArthur's excellent motion on skin cancer, and um, I couldn't agree with you more. Men have to listen better to what their bodies are telling them. We all have to do better, um, but prevention is better than cure. And I would like to join with you with what you said about encouraging people to make sure that you get the medical checkups that you need and you look after yourself um, when you can. So thank you for that contribution. Um, and thank you, Member for North Sydney, for this motion. I think it's um, an important conversation to have about how we can do all that we can to reduce emissions and be more energy efficient. And sometimes we focus on the big and really important debates and forget to talk about um, the, th the other things that we can do, which aren't small, um, but perhaps uh, more easily digested and should be thought about more than the big issue of how we um, transition out of fossil fuels into renewable energy. And this is also part of it. Um, before I talk about uh, the government's plan for better energy performance and add some extra thoughts of my own, um, I wanted to talk about one of the ways we are trying to do this in my local community and have had support um, from the Albanese government. Um, Karen Downs in my electorate uh, is a great part um, of South East Melbourne, um, but it has to be said it's not one of the wealthiest parts. No, it's full of hard-working um, Australians who struggle with any change in their weekly, let alone daily, um, cost of living. And I think that's partly why households across Karen Downs have embraced renewable energy with solar uptake at a higher rate than the Victorian average. Um, you know, more than one in five households across the entire city of Frankston, which is most of my electorate, um, have solar. But there is no doubt that for most households, the high price of batteries means that families are still struggling uh, to release the full potential of rooftop solar, putting more pressure on our electricity grid. And with the current issues with rising um, power prices, it is more important than ever that we help households and families um, to play their part, which I know is what the member for North Sydney's um, motion is also partly about, but to play their part in doing what they can about not just reducing emissions, but also reducing their power bills. Um, so that's why I was thrilled when an election commitment was made to uh, have a community battery in Caram Downs. Um, and I was, it must be said, even more thrilled when the Minister for Climate Change and Energy announced that Caram Downs would have one of the first 58 batteries. Um, and the uh, tender is now open for applications to deliver that project. Uh, and I have before, and I do again urge um, people in my community, businesses, individuals and organisations to look at that tender process um, and to apply. Um, it is something that is going to make a big difference to the people of Caram Downs. And I'm very hopeful that when this uh, rolls out more broadly, because the benefits are seen, it will also benefit other people across my electorate. As I'm sure other government members have said when they've spoken um, on this motion, uh, we are looking to develop a robust energy performance strategy. There is no doubt that if we work together with businesses and communities, but also all levels of government, local, state and federal, we can build better homes. We can upgrade existing stocks. We can bring better transparency to home energy performance. We can now use more efficient appliances in our homes and our businesses and better equipment in our industries. And we can find smart ways to manage demand, to use less electricity and to use it when it's cheapest and cleanest. Um, we do want to empower people to do that. And the Assistant Minister, um, McAllister, has announced that she will deliver a national energy performance strategy to bring coordination and leadership to demand side reform. We have many of the solutions that we need now. We just need the goodwill of all levels of government to work together to deliver them and to make sure that we utilise the technology 
that will undoubtedly be developed every moment of every day into the future. I thank, thank the member. And the question is that the motion be agreed to. And I call the member for Riverina. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And goodwill amongst governments is one thing, uh, but what we also need to make sure for this motion put forward by the member for North Sydney is that housing can still be affordable. Now, I very much appreciate that a better insulated house is going to reduce energy prices. Understandable. No, no qualms, no questions there. But what we can't do is, because of ideology, push the prices up so that it makes new homes, or any homes for that matter, uh, renovations, refurbishments, uh, unaffordable to the average buyer. Stricter energy standards for new homes and those new laws and regulations put in place in New South Wales is seeing the cost of building a house in Wagga Wagga, in my hometown, surge by up to $30,000. Now, yes, it may also lead to cheaper energy bills for residents, but when we've got higher prices for groceries, higher prices for energy costs, when we've got higher uh, everything, uh, cost of living, why would we want to go and just for the sake of ideology, push the price of the average house for the new home buyer up by $30,000. Now, the New South Wales government announced, and this was going back uh, September last year, uh, all new homes and renovations which will cost more than $50,000 will need to meet a seven-star energy rating from October this year. Now, the current minimum rating uh, at that time was just 5.5 stars. And uh, builders uh, were told, as part of this legislation, that they would uh, need to start implementing better insulation, more double glazed windows and smarter layouts to reach the new requirement. Now, some might argue, well, that's all well and good. But this is an industry which is fighting the good fight against higher prices for timber. Where do they source timber? Uh, nobody, nobody in this uh, country these days seems to want to cut down a tree. Uh, the, the price for just the metal brackets uh, to go on, on frames uh, has, is, is, if you could get those metal brackets, imported or otherwise, has gone through the roof. The price has soared. Uh, now, I regularly get texts from uh, Wagga Wagga builder Wayne Carter. Uh, he described the change brought about by the state government as another blow for the construction industry, which uh, I might add, is also facing, like every other industry, uh, where do they find labour? Uh, if, they, if they can find labour, how much do they have to pay those workers to keep them, retain them in the sector? It's been on the table for a while and we've all been shuddering for it to be adopted, he said. It means it's going to cost so much more to build a house and that's a cost which the local people who want to own homes can ill afford. I agree with Mr Carter. Uh, I know... Uh, from very, very personal experience. My wife, Catherine, worked in the industry uh, for 17 years as a regional manager. And uh, her company, Dennis Family Homes, a Melbourne-based company, has shut up uh, some of its regional operations uh, because of the downturn in the industry. Uh, it's tough. And, uh, and I know, even despite the measures put in place by the member for Deakin to get the industry uh, Making, its, making sure it was its best self during COVID. Uh, it, it was hard to find labour, hard, hard for the industry, to, in, industry whether they were um, local small-time operators or whether they were a big housing company like Dennis uh, or others uh, to, to make ends meet. But not only that, labour comes to, uh, to government and promises a million uh, social houses, so social, affordable social housing. Um, good luck. I say good luck with that. I'll be, I'll be watching with keen interest to see uh, whether that actually comes off. Um, Glenn Maslin, another local operator in Wagga Wagga, house builder in Wagga, says the price of housing has increased by 15 per cent because of COVID. And now you're looking at another 5 per cent on top of that. The industry is going to suffer from all these additional changes that's, that, keep, that seem to keep coming in. So it's, it's difficult for... We, we need to think uh, in this space about those people. Uh, it's about balance, Deputy Speaker, and I 
I, I acknowledge the, the member for North Sydney and her good intent with this private uh, member's bill, but it's all about uh, it's all about all about making sure that we can keep housing affordable for the person who wants to get into their new house or wants to uh, to buy for their family. I thank the member and. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Gilmore. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Well, Australia is no stranger to extreme weather: heat waves, droughts, floods, bushfires. Our community on the New South Wales south coast has seen our fair share of it over the last few years. We know what it means to have reliable and efficient energy, or rather, should I say, we know what it means when that reliability fails because of climate change. In the wake of so many disasters, many local people are looking for new ways to climate-proof their homes. As we move into the next phase of our recovery, we are seeing a new set of questions being asked. The South Coast community saw direct and direct impacts from these string of disasters. So the question is broader than just looking at what, where or what we build, it's about how we build. It's not just about protection from fire or protection from flood. It's also resilience about power failures, protection against heat and smoke, protection against mould, mildew and water inundation. We have just witnessed a decade of neglect from the previous government, failure to make a real energy plan, failure to take action on climate change, failure to address our escalating houses, housing crisis. So these questions should come as no surprise. Well, the Albanese government is not going to make the same mistakes they did. We have already enshrined our emissions target in law, taking real action to address our changing climate. We have already started the path for our Powering Australia plan. During the election, I was delighted to promise a community battery for the Maloney's Beach community, helping people in this village reduce their energy costs, reduce their reliance on external power supplies, making them more resilient and better prepared for the future. In the wake of the bushfires, the Maloney's Beach Residents Association identified power and communications resilience as a key theme that local people wanted addressed. They did some research and found that if they had a whole of community buy-in, it would be cheaper and more efficient to have a battery and backup power generators. We agreed, and now we have the community battery for household solar program that can help communities like Maloney's Beach do just that. I'm really excited to see that come to fruition, but it is only just the beginning. More efficient homes improve our energy consumption, reduce emissions, improve resilience and improve health. It is win-win, not just for communities, but also for government, saving us all money in the long run. It is smart policy for individuals and for the country. With a government that will actually lead the way, we can have a sensible and constructive conversation about improving our energy performance to help us reduce emissions, instead of hyperbole and hysteria about the type of power we can actually make Australia an energy powerhouse. This is a real and genuine way to reduce energy costs and drive our transition to emissions efficient power, smarter, cheaper, cleaner. So we will waste no time, we have already begun. In October, we announced that the Albanese government will deliver a national energy performance strategy, our long-term plan to bring affordability, reliability and sustainability to our energy system. We want to empower people to improve the energy performance of their homes because we know the wide-ranging benefits that will have, not just in times of disaster, but all year round. As part of our $15.2 million investment over four years, to provide a framework for demand side action, we released a consultation paper in November so that we can work with all stakeholders to develop a comprehensive energy performance plan, one that will take the pressure off of prices and take the pressure off our climate. Supporting en efficient energy use and looking at the suitability of our targets to drive better energy performance across the country. What Australia has lacked over the last decade of the Liberals is a sensible government, holding sensible and constructive conversations with the experts about how we can tackle the challenges our energy sector is facing. We won't achieve anything with hysteria about so-called 
health impacts of wind farms. The science on that is settled. We won't achieve anything with distracting conversations about nuclear power. The science is settled on that as well. What we must do and must do now is address our changing climate and do what we can. We must prepare our communities for the very real impacts climate change is already having. We simply have to support locals with cheaper, cleaner, efficient energy and better energy performance. The Albanese government is committed to doing this without the hysteria. Just sensible conversations with the experts and our communities. I thank the member. The time allotted for this debate has expired. The debate is adjourned and the resumption of the debate will be made in order of the day for the next sitting. And I call the clerk. Private members' business, notice number eight relating to pharmaceutical benefits scheme. I call the member for Macquarie. Um, MacArthur, thank MacArthur, you. MacArthur, sorry. <laughs> MacArthur. <laughs> Deputy Speaker. I knew it was a Mac. <laughs> um, I ask the Leader of the Federation Chamber to move notice number eight, private members' business, on behalf of the member for Robertson. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I move a motion relating to the pharmaceutical benefit scheme and the terms in which it appears on the notice paper. So I'm delighted to support this motion moved by the member for Robertson, my uh, dear friend, Dr Gordon Reid, who is a, a great asset to this parliament. Um, I'm also proud to be a member of the Albanese government that introduced and passed the National Health Amendment, General Co-Payment Bill 2022. This legislation successfully resulted in cheaper medicines for almost 19 million Australians by ensuring that they pay almost 30 per cent less for their pharmaceutical benefits uh, scheme scripts. This is a win for all Australians, old, young, families and individuals as it's now easier to access affordable medicines. And because uh, of the uh, increasing cost of living uh, stresses on families, I, as a paediatrician, I fully support this, uh, fully supported this legislation. And I'm very grateful that we've been able to do this. As a doctor, I understand how stressful the cost of medication can be for patients and their families. It can sometimes be the difference between food in the fridge or prescription forms being completed. And not infrequently, I've had patients ask me, when given a, a list of medications they need for their child, what are the most important ones and which ones should they get straight away? This is true for young families who have, may have uh, several kids with asthma, uh, kids with uh, severe eczema, for example, requiring multiple, multiple treatments. Uh, children with multiple allergies, uh, children with uh, a number of different uh, disorders, including epilepsy. Um, it was often a question for those families whether they should uh, get all the prescriptions filled when they were needed uh, to see if they could delay at least some of them so they could afford the cost. This uh, legislation really is an achievement worth noting. No other government has delivered cheaper medicines at this rate. And it's the first time that the cost of general scripts has fallen in the 75 year history of the pharmaceutical benefits scheme, uh, which you would all be aware was a, uh, a, a great um, victory for the Chifley Labor government. Uh, in MacArthur, my electorate, this legislation is already having a significant effect and positive impact with over 100,000 people benefiting already from this, ensuring more households can access medications that's needed this, with less financial pressure than before. I note the Assistant Minister for Health and Aged Care, Jed Carney, who also mentioned in a second reading speech about the legislation, how Australians living with diabetes, which, which is, is millions of people, are some of the biggest winners from this legislation. Uh, children are some of the biggest winners from this legislation, I would say, because they now can get all the treatments that they require. For an example, an individual who has 13 scripts per year for diabetes medication will save over $160, as the cost of the script has fallen uh, for non-pensioners from $42.50 to $30. Another winner is those who require um, a tablet uh, for the prevention of stroke. 
uh, a, a, if you like, an anticoagulant or blood thinning medication. Under this legislation, those that require 26 scripts per year are saving $325 every year, which is a huge financial win for Australian patients and their families. I believe that this legislation is also an important step ensuring, in ensuring that healthcare access in Australia remains equitable, as equitable as possible. Because I really think at the moment there are questions about the equity of access to healthcare in Australia after 10 years of a coalition government. Um, health uh, access is becoming increasingly difficult for some of the poorest Australians and that's something that we must fight against. Health access is important for everyone, not just wealthy people. And the Albanese government is doing its best to try and reverse the trends of the last 10 years. Medication is important for people across the, the age spectrum, uh, from the very young to the very old. We've often heard how pharmacists are often asked which is the cheaper brand options, whether certain medications are necessary or not. Labor has a strong commitment and a proud record in healthcare. And we're doing our best as part of our ideology is to deal with the inequities in access to health care. I really look forward to changes that the Albanese government will be making to make health access much more equitable. Thank you. Thank the members. Is the motion seconded? Second the motion, yes, and preserve my right to speak. Okay. And would you like to speak or reserve your right to speak? Speaking list later on. Um, so right okay. Yes. Okay. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Sturt. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak on this motion about the PBS and, and health more generally. And also, this motion goes to the issue of cost of living, um, uh, which I want to touch on from a health point of view and more generally. But firstly, um, I was very pleased to speak, uh, of course, in support of legislation that brought in the uh, dramatic reduction in the co-payment, which of course was an announcement that the coalition made in the election campaign, and it was uh, it was matched by the then Labor opposition. And last year in the Parliament, we had the opportunity to debate and pass that legislation, and it was an excellent outcome from a cost of living point of view. Of course, making medicines cheaper for people, medicines that are listed on the PBS. Uh, is uh, something that I was very proud that uh, the government I was a part of announced in the campaign. Uh, we had bipartisanship around that principle uh, by virtue of both sides agreeing to put it in place. And then, of course, uh, it was uh, just a few months ago that we passed it through the parliament. And that's a great outcome for the many millions of people that benefit from that reduction in the cost of the co-payment uh, through the PBS. I'd also like to thank the TGA uh, for the work that they do. and. Uh, uh, there's a lot of they've had a, you know, a lot of uh, uh, work to do over the last couple of years dealing with members of the public and their views on them, etc. And I think we're very lucky to have at the system that we've got, which starts with the TGA and moves through to PBS listing. And I really do also commend um, uh, former Minister Greg Hunt for the enormous number of uh, medicines that were listed on the PBS uh, during his tenure. And I remember uh, all the times we would hear in the Parliament about. Uh, the new medicines that were listed on the PBS and how life-changing that, that is for people that need access to that uh, treatment. And of course, uh, it being on the PBS can make an enormous difference. In some cases, can go from someone having costs of hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to having uh, costs in the hundreds of dollars a year for treatment that they absolutely uh, deserve to have supported through the PBS uh, system. Uh, of course, during COVID, uh, while we were in government, we uh, deployed the uh, rollout of telehealth, which uh, really is important to couple with the issue of um, prescription, because during that time, of course, um, when uh, it was you know, very difficult to access a physical consult with a GP, one of the great reforms that would have taken years, probably decades, were it not for the um, uh, challenge of COVID and therefore a, a great openness for faster reform, we delivered uh, that telehealth rollout. And I think it is worth remembering that uh, uh, in, uh, in the universal telehealth rollout, we were able to deliver 100 million telehealth consults, 100 million. Uh, and that was to 17 million uh, people, of course, um, uh, bulk built 
And that was quite transformative. And when it comes to the access, access to medicines and prescriptions, that was one of the things that was uh, such an obvious opportunity of telehealth, uh, where there's an opportunity to undertake a repeat prescription in particular and have a very straightforward, smooth uh, consult via telehealth rather than having to have a physical appointment. Uh, both the risk during COVID of that, but also, of course, the reality that uh, uh, telehealth is much more efficient and, uh, and quicker and uh, meant that we didn't have the situation that you do hear at, about at times where people, because of access issues, uh, have a prescription medicine uh, that they haven't had the prescription renewed and, and perhaps have a period of time or go off that, that medication that they should be on. And that's one of the great outcomes of telehealth, coupled with PBS, uh, reforms that we announced, uh, that is an excellent cost of living outcome for people. But the risk that we have now is that even though we have a bipartisan dramatic reduction in the co-payment, what is going to happen in the years ahead uh, as potential uh, indexation increases within this scheme and other healthcare costs come into play when inflation is running so hot at nearly 8%? Because uh, that is what I do worry about now, is that having um, dramatically reduced uh, the uh, co-payment, is that going to be slowly eaten away by uh, indexation increases uh, that will come and hit um, uh, all of those that access the PBS equally as hard as the high inflation environment that we're in right now comes to play, which is why it is disingenuous in this motion uh, to crow about some spectacular cost of living outcome from this, because uh, the way things are structured and the way things will happen going forward, unless there's any changes, is that we, there will be some major indexation increases coming into the future. It's up to the government to decide whether they will absorb that rather than pass it along to consumers. I thank the member. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Benelong. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for Robertson for giving us all this great opportunity to get up and speak about this policy and its life-saving abilities and its uh, ability to reduce uh, the pressures on costs of living, because we know that Australian patients will, for the first time since the creation of the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme, get a much-needed cut to the cost of medicines, leaving more money in people's pockets to provide for their families. And at a time when cost of living is going up, putting pressure on families across the country, this is one measure showing that the government is working hard to ensure that the relief it provides is targeted, measured and such that does not add to the inflationary time bomb we inherited from the former government. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, more than 900,000 patients delayed or didn't get a script filled in 2019 to 2020 due to the cost of their medications. No one, Deputy Speaker, should have to choose between filling prescriptions for life-saving medicines and affording their day-to-day -day necessities. Our determination to deliver cheaper medicines will help everyday Australians. Under the cheaper medicines policy, the co-payment has reduced from $42.50 to just $30. That's a whopping 29% reduction. This means for PBS medications, you'll only pay up to $30 and the government covers the rest. And this is having real world benefits. This is helping everyday Australians. Penelope, in, the, in my electorate in Benelong, contacted me at the end of last year. She's been a carer for her mum for the past seven years. She had a broken ankle, was struggling to walk and struggling to make ends meet. She wanted to know how she could get access to cheaper medications to make some savings where she could. Because of the commitment of this government from the 1st of January, uh, she's now saving on her medications. She now has more money in her budget to help provide for her family. So since the 1st of January, when uh, this legislation came into effect, people like Penelope can now better afford medicines that they need to keep themselves and their family healthy. Someone taking one medicine a month is now saving $150 every year. A family with two or three medications are now saving between $300 and $450 a year. That's money back in their pocket and back in the household budget. That's real cost of living relief, targeting those who really need it. And in Benelong, cheaper medicine will mean over 87,000 patients putting money back into their pockets, money back for their families. 
They're now saving a collective amount of over $4.7 million a year. Being a local, I've visited a number of pharmacies uh, in my electorate since this policy was announced and since its implementation. I've been to the Amcal chemist in the Macquarie Centre and to see Kevin, Johnny and Vivian at the North Ride Pharmacy in Cox's Road Mall and also my little pharmacy around the corner at Blenheim Road. These pharmacies and their staff are trusted, they care for their patients and they have an intimate understanding of their patients' needs. And they all had the same story, Deputy Speaker. They told me of the scores of people that would go up to the counter with multiple scripts asking their pharmacist, which medicine can I afford to miss out on this week? These stories of people risking their health and going without the medicines they need because they could not afford their medications. And they're not just story, they're real people. Real people who are now, because of this government, paying less for their medicine. The 87 patients, 1,000 patients in Benelong who will benefit from this form just one part of the 3.6 million Australians who have been saving on their medical scripts since the 1st of January under this government. We know, that our, we know our communities and we know that vulnerable Australians deserve to be supported. That's why we have taken every opportunity, uh, particularly at this time, to ease the cost of living. And as I uh, close up, um, Deputy Speaker, I'd just like to particularly pay tribute to the members of this parliament who have a wealth of experience being doctors, GPs and pharmacists. The member for MacArthur, Higgins, Kuyong, McKellar, Dobell and, of course, the member for Romerson. I'm sure they catch up regularly and exchange notes and, uh, as part of the medical caucus, but what a time for such an experienced bunch of uh, citizens to be in this parliament at a time when we know we need to improve access uh, to medicines and to our medical system. So thank you for all they bring to this place. I thank the member. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Kuyong. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank you to the member for Benelong for his kind words. I rise to speak today in um, response to this motion regarding the re recent reduction of co the cost of medications on the PBS. Mr Speaker, healthy nations are prosperous nations. Australia's universal health system Medicare, our world-class hospitals and the pharmaceutical benefits scheme are perhaps our greatest national asset. For this reason, I welcome the government's decision to reduce the patient contribution to medicines under the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. A 30 per cent reduction in costs represents very real savings for Australian households. We know that the out-of-pocket costs to patients of GP visits and medicines are an increasing burden to many of us in this time of significant cost of living pressures. Accessible medicines are a pillar of our national health system. Medications have to be not just affordable, they have to be accessible. Australia imports more than 90 per cent of its medications. In fact, we're dangerously dependent on imported medicines. Recent supply chain issues have impacted many of my constituents, putting them at risk of harm from side effects related to alternative preparations, but also to long-term health complications of uncontrolled disease. Mr Ian Picken from Baldwin told me, when seeking to purchase a monthly update of my prescription, which I've been taking for several years, my pharmacist advised that there is currently no stock. It's now several weeks that I've been waiting for, for supplies to be available. My pharmacist has put me on a priority list and has undertaken to call me once he has that stock hopefully next week. Another Kuyong constituent, Daniel, is worried about being forced to change his medications. He said, I found out from my doctor that the company has stopped making the drug and no other company makes it as it's no longer profitable. That is the bottom line. So I have to come off my drugs gradually and then nothing for at least another week before I can try another drug. He added, and he's right, you cannot change your medication like you change your socks. Mr Alex Mazzolini of Hawthorne advised me that on several occasions when I have been unable to get my diabetes medication, I've had to go on half dose to make the supply last longer. In the past few months alone, we've seen shortages of multiple antibiotics in Australia, including paediatric preparations, shortages of diabetes medications and of antidepressants. How many Australians are having their health compromised by a lack of access to the medications that they need. Other constituents have expressed frustration in relation to the dis 
prescribing and dispensing of medications in this country. They describe unnecessary, costly visits to their GP for repeat prescriptions and the limits placed on supply at the pharmacy, which cost both inconvenience but also often additional cost. The need for routine repeat scripts is an inconvenience. It's an avoidable cost to Medicare. It's an unnecessary demand on the GP sector. And more and more, it's an increased out-of-pocket cost to patients. The supply of prescription medications by pharmacies is regulated. Multiple prescriptions are supplied only in certain circumstances. In 2018, the PBAC recommended allowing dispensing of two months at a time of 143 commonly dispensed medications. Why are we still paying too much in dispensing fees? Our health system needs reform in order to adapt to changing demographics and the evolving health pressures. We need system revision with flexibility and agility. We need to un avoid unnecessary repetition of both medical and pharmaceutical services. And we need to give patients greater agency over the management of their own health. We also need a national strategy to ensure reliable supply of medications, including a review of our sovereign manufacturing capacity and how our government can support it better. While our domestic market is small, we do have established supply chains and we have great proximity to the Pacific market. We could expand our manufacturing capacity, decrease our sovereign risk and support our Pacific partners by increasing local manufacturing of pharmaceuticals. I thank my constituents for allowing me to share their personal experiences, which are the experiences of many Australians. There is still much work to do for us to make medicines more equitably, affordable and reliably accessible for all Australians. I thank the member. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Chisholm. Thank you so much, Deputy Speaker. Uh, as someone who grew up in a household where um, her, my parents ran uh, their own uh, medical practice, the importance of universal public health is really something that's been instilled uh, within me from a very young age. And I'm really excited to stand here today and speak about uh, legislation that we'll see uh, for the first time since the creation of the PBS. Uh, patients pay less for medicines. Unfortunately, we are in the midst of a cost of living crisis uh, inherited from the previous government and anything we can do to relieve the cost of living pressures on families is really important to my community and indeed communities right across Australia. Health is really important to my community, as I'm sure it is to the communities of all of my colleagues here today. In my electorate of Chisholm, there's some really exciting news around health. The Victorian Heart Hospital, which was funded by the Victorian Labor government and Monash University, will shortly open its doors, and it is the first and only cardiac hospital in Australia. We've recently turned the sod for Moderna in my electorate of Chisholm too, and they will join Pfizer as just two of the pharmaceutical and medical technology companies to set up businesses in my local area. So the importance of health, of medicines, of an accessible, equitable and well-funded health system really matters to my community. Uh, we'll also shortly see the National Reconstruction Fund be debated uh, in this place. And this is a really important policy that we took to the last uh, election and was very well received in my community. We have all experienced the global shortages of medicines due to disrupted supply chains, but also due to a failure for investment in sovereign capability and domestic um, manufacturing capacity. These are the high wage, high skill jobs of the future. And on our watch, we will see this kind of manufacturing, this kind of advanced manufacturing uh, be revived once again to provide the good secure jobs that our communities rely on. And more than that, to make the kinds of things like medicines that our communities need. I think everyone was really shocked um, to, at the extent to which we were unable to make things here in Australia. And so I'm really pleased that under our government that's going to change. Labor governments, including the Albanese Labor government, have always invested and defended public health in this country. Of course, we were, we were the first people to bring in universal health care in Australia and unfortunately had to reintroduce it after it was abolished by the coalition. 
what we're doing with this piece of legislation, uh, the co-payment bill, and I'm really excited to speak about it, and it has already um, been making a difference to hip pockets, is saving people money. Not only are we saving people money, we're removing the horrible choice that people have to make between whether they go to the pharmacy and pay for life-saving medications, or they pay for their groceries, or their rent, or their petrol. This is a choice nobody in a country like Australia should ever be forced to make. We should be protecting our universal healthcare system and make sure it is equitable for everybody. So now, instead of um, you know, paying what people used to for medications if they had uh, one script that needed to be filled, they will be saving $150 a year, while those filling two scripts a month could save around $300 a year. There are 3.6 million Australians with current prescriptions over $30 who are already saving money. Uh, it is devastating that people have been forced into situations where they are making choices around their health uh, because they might not be able to afford to get um, access to medicines. And of course, we've also seen people not being able to afford to go and see a, a general practitioner in the first instance to get a prescription. And in fact, over the last decade, in my electorate alone, and I suspect the numbers are similar in other places around the country, the out-of-pocket costs uh, that people experience going to to a GP increased by a shocking 38 per cent. So in that instance too, we are seeing people making very difficult, very dangerous decisions about not seeing uh, medical practitioners because they simply can't afford it. That's not good enough. We're doing better. I'm really pleased that people are starting to save money. We are committed to Medicare. We are committed to equitable, genuine universal health. And I'm really pleased that the member for Robertson has put this motion to the House. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. I thank the member. And the question is that the motion be agreed to. And I call the member for Monash. Um, Deputy Speaker, I was intrigued with the former contribution, having regard the fact that uh, everybody is agreed on universal health care. Everybody wants the best death for their community. And there's a very clear statement by the member that these families are under enormous pressure on cost of living expenses exacerbated by the problems within health care in Australia. Deputy Speaker, right around the country we're seeing the ramping of hospitals, of ambulance ramping at every hospital and it's getting worse and worse. It's not getting better. This is exacerbated by cuts to the telehealth and mental health rebates, exhausted and overwhelmed GPs, doctors, nurses, allied health professionals. Our health and hospital systems are in free fall. In fact, there was one lady who was going for an allied health care appointment in Gippsland. She was in such pain she thought she'd call in to the hospital on her way to the appointment for some pain relief. And they said, it's no good sitting here, we can't see you for two and a half hours. It's no good sitting here, we can't see you for two and a half hours. And she's in such pain that she called into the hospital for help. I've never known a time like this in my time as a representative or a member of a community. No one seems to care enough about what's happening in the system to ask questions. No one's asking why. What's causing our nation's first class health system to crumble in so many areas? There's a lot of blame being attributed to workforce shortages and staff being sick with COVID and other flu viruses. So why isn't the health minister putting pressure on the state counterparts to drop the insidious and redundant COVID-19 mandates and reinstate our heroic frontline workers who remain unable to work <coughs> due to the mandates because they are not vaccinated. One of these workers 
Lexi Tuckett, she doesn't mind me using her name, she's 22 years of age and her story is heartbreaking. Lexi told me it was always her dream to help others and she was rightly very proud when she graduated in December 2021 with a Bachelor of Paramedicine. Four weeks later, she started her induction with the New South Wales Ambulance Service, part of the pre-employment check related to vaccines, but she was not at all concerned. She was up to date with all vaccines and had a medical exemption for COVID-19 vaccination approved by Medicare with a signed letter from a doctor. On the second day of her induction, Lexi received an email from New South Wales Ambulance to advise that her exem exemption had not met the ATAGI guidelines and that her COVID-19 vaccination exemption could not be approved. To continue with New South Wales Ambulance, she'd have to have her first dose of COVID-19 vaccination in three days' time and a second dose three weeks later after that. While Lexi's parents thought urgent legal advice on her behalf, Lexi was stood down effective immediately and advised she would be placed on leave without pay until vaccinated. Lexi was able to give her service to the High Country Ski Patrol. Why is it that you can give your service to save a life, which she did in the high country, working with the ski patrol, but she can't work as a paramedic, pan, pan, as a pa, a paramedic in New South Wales? Why could that be? And how many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds are professional health workers out there cleaning toilets and washing dishes instead of doing what they should be doing? helping the people that they love. I thank the member. And the question is that the motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Newcastle. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Well, Australians are doing it tough. And after nine years of neglect from the former government, the cost of living is soaring, and many Australians are cutting back on essentials in order to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. As the member for Newcastle, I know that Novocastrians are feeling the pinch. An ABC article this morning highlighted the story of a Newcastle loca, local, Theresa Hetherington. I know Theresa well. She's a hard worker and immensely dedicated to the clients she sees in her job as a home carer. But Theresa says the days at the end of her pay cycle are hair-raising. She is reliant on her car to travel from client to client and fueling up has become so expensive, she often has to choose between putting $20 worth of petrol in the car or eating. Theresa loves her job and has more than two decades of experience in the home care sector. But in order to cope with rising costs, she has to take a second job in a local clothes store. She says she simply can't function without an additional source of income. These are incredibly tough times. And unfortunately, Theresa's story is not unique. For other families, the high cost of living means choosing between filling prescriptions for potentially life-saving medicines and providing for their families. The co-payment for general patients has doubled since 2000. And according to ABS figures, more than 900,000 Australians delayed or did not get a script filled in 2019-2020 due to costs. To provide optimum health care to all Australians, we've got to turn this around. As a member for Newcastle, I am determined to deliver better outcomes for our community's future and for every household. The Albanese Labor government is putting in place a number of measures to help ease that pressure on household budgets. One such way we have done this is by reducing the maximum amount that Australians pay for their pharmaceutical benefits scheme medicines. The Pharmaceutical Benefit Scheme, or the PBS as it's most commonly known, is a significant component of the Commonwealth's investment in our health system.
with the government allocating $13.8 billion in the 2020-21 financial year to make medicines more affordable. The Labor government's changes, which come into effect uh, on the 1st of January, mean that Australians are now paying up to 30 per cent less for their prescriptions. Our reduction to that co-payment means that the maximum Australians will pay for PBS medicines now is $30, down from $42.50. With this reduction of $12.50, 3.6 million Australians will, with current prescriptions over $30 will immediately save on medical scripts. People filling one script a month could save around $150 a year, while those filling two scripts a month could save around $300. In Newcastle, these changes will benefit 92,519 Novocastrians in filling almost 250,000 scripts each year. It's an estimated saving to Novocastrians of $3.5 million, and that is not to be sneezed at. This is indeed the first time in its 75-year history that the maximum cost of general scripts under the PBS has fallen. And I am so proud to be part of an Albanese Labor government that is taking direct action to help ease pressure on family budgets. We do not want to see patients having to choose between the health care they need and providing for their families. This change is just one way that we're helping to ease the burden on Australian families, particularly those with chronic illnesses. All Australians should have access to universal, prompt and world-class medical care. That's Labor's mission and it's our vision for Australia. <laughs> I thank the member. There being no further speakers, the debate is adjourned and the resumption of the debate will be made in order of the day for the next sitting. And I call the clerk. Private members' business, order of the day number one, resumption of debate on the motion related to nuclear energy. The question is that the, member be, the motion be agreed to and I call the member for Flynn. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. I rise, rise to support the member for Lyons' motion. I also wish to speak about what the nuclear industry could mean for Australia and particularly my electorate of Flynn in central Queensland. According to Labor's budget estimates, the next two years will see an increase of electricity prices by 56 per cent. So how can these electricity prices be reduced? Australia has signed up to zero, uh, net zero emissions by 2050. And how can this be achieved? Deputy Speaker, the answer is right in front of us. It is nuclear energy. Australia is the only G20 country not to have nuclear energy. According to the US Office of Nuclear Energy, nuclear is the largest source of clean power in the United States and is worth an estimated $60 billion to the country's gross domestic product. If that works in the United States and in Europe and elsewhere, why can't it work in Australia? Cost estimates for the nuclear energy can range from $65 a megawatt hour or below, which is less than a new coal plant, to over $300 a megawatt hour, high above the high cost diesel generators. A small modular reactor has a maximum energy capacity of 7,300,000 megawatt hours a year. Deputy Speaker, support for the nuclear power is growing. A Lowy Institute poll last year found a majority would support removing the ban on nuclear power. In 2011, only 35 per cent of people were in favour of nuclear energy. Nuclear power is safe and has resulted in far fewer deaths than from dam failures, oil rig explosions and even on some measures the number of people who fall off while installing solar panels. Nuclear does less damage to the natural environment than other energy options. Wind energy takes 250 times more land than nuclear power. Solar energy takes up 150 times more land. Between 1965 and 2018, the world spent two trillion on nuclear energy, compared to 2.3 trillion on solar and wind. Yet nuclear today produces around double the electricity of that of solar and wind, and is 95% reliable, while solar and wind are 25% 
and 35 per cent productive, respectively. The nuclear asset life ranges from 40 to 80 years, which is far longer than the solar or wind projects that average around 20 years. What people fail to recognise is that this means that solar or wind projects need to be installed and disassembled possibly four times in the lifespan of a nuclear asset. This is also not mentioning the environmental impact of renewable energy, as wind turbine blades can't be recycled, so they're piling up in landfills. Australia has 20 coal-fired power stations, which employ a total of 4,800 people. The Flynn electorate has uh, three coal-fired power stations, Calloyd, Stanmore and Gladstone. Deputy Speaker, on the September 28th, the Queensland Labor government announced plans to move to a transition Queensland coal-fired power stations to a clean energy hub from 2027. So why don't we convert these uh, power stations in the electorate of Flynn to nuclear power stations uh, when the time comes? In the United States, they are converting coal-fired power stations to nuclear plants, which provide tangible economic employment and environmental benefits to local communities. It would also not require the massive expense of rewiring the grid with high-voltage transmission lines that are required to connect solar and wind farms. You may simply plug into the existing system with a nuclear option. Deputy Speaker, we already have a nuclear reactor in Australia and have had for many, many years. The Lucas Heights Nuclear Medicine Facility is right in the middle of Sydney. And we all know somebody who has suffered from cancer and has undergone radiation therapy. Lucas Heights is where this medical treatment is developed, so to argue that nuclear technology is not safe is not correct. Deputy Speaker, Australia has the world's largest known reserves of uranium, and we export it to over 40 countries worldwide. We have these reserves, so why not use them? It is rather hypocritical to have a zero tolerance policy in respect to nuclear energy when we provide the world with the primary source to make nuclear power possible. In conclusion, Deputy Speaker, it's important that Australia plans for the future, and I believe nuclear power is the answer to our energy needs. And to the federal government, I say, let's have this conversation. It's time for an open discussion. I thank the member. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Benelong. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'd like to start by thanking the member for Lyon for yet another opportunity to have a conversation about nuclear energy. I'd like to remind the member that he and his party had the last nine years of, of government to implement some sort of effective energy policy. They had 22 chances with their stop-start energy policies to implement some sort of effective change. And what we see now is that Australians are feeling the crunch of the havoc in energy markets that they caused. But we come here today and we see that the opposition's solution is to look at an energy source that is the most expensive and the slowest to implement. I mean, I just don't understand why we're still here having yet another conversation about nuclear power. Maybe they think that if they can talk about nuclear energy for long enough, maybe they can distract the Australian people from their failed energy policies, that they can distract them from the fact that they dump their emissions intensity scheme or that they dumped their clean energy target or that they dumped three versions of the National Energy Guarantee or that they dumped a Prime Minister over their energy policy failures. But there's one thing we know that the Liberals and Nationals in this place cannot dump, and that is their unhealthy obsession with nuclear power. And so I did a little bit of research, Deputy Speaker. Um, we had uh, the former uh, member just there mention that we should start a conversation about nuclear power. Well, I thought I'd, just, I'd see how long have the Liberals and Nationals been talking about nuclear power. How long have we had to hear about their little radioactive carrot that they dangle in front of their radioactive base every now and then? And believe it or not, they've been having this conversation for 68 years. Hansard shows that Senator Spooner, in 1955, took to the dispatch box to praise nuclear energy. 55 years they've been having this conversation, and we're here again today. The Liberals and Nationals talk about nuclear about putting nuclear reactors right across Australia. But we all know the real facts, and we'll say them again, just as they were told back in 1955, nuclear energy for Australia does just not stack up. It's too expensive, 
it takes too long to build, and we have no plan to get rid of the radioactive waste. I mean, you should have seen the list of reasons, Deputy Speaker, as I typed up as to why nuclear energy isn't the solution. But you know, I've only got five minutes, so I've put it down into a little speech, so that next time this comes up, they, you know, those opposite may want to listen to this speech again because the reasons will be the same. Nuclear energy doesn't pass any reasonable economic test, and it certainly doesn't pass the pub test. It can't be introduced or maintained without a huge cost to taxpayers, and it is the most expensive form of energy today. More expensive than coal and gas, and of course, more expensive than renewable energy. Even the industry itself, the World Nuclear Industry Status Report of 2020 said that nuclear, despite over half a century of industrial experience, continue to see costs rising. And CSIRO and AEMO continue to, re to produce report after report that has found nuclear would be far and away the most expensive form of energy for Australia. And they talk about, now they're talking about these small modular reactors, uh, this, this uh, silver bullet for nuclear energy. And AEMO and CSIRO found that these reactors would cost $16,773 a kilowatt in capital costs. That's $5 billion per, per reactor, and that Australia would need 80 reactors. That's $400 billion for yet another liberal energy folly. Compare that to what this government are doing. Contrast that to what the world is doing, investing in renewable energy. Renewable energy is a proven technology with low cost, with global momentum, investment desire, and importantly, near immediate uh, dispatchable power. Renewable energy is creating jobs in the cities, it's creating jobs in the regions, it's the cheapest form of energy available today, and it's only getting cheaper. And renewables can be built quickly, meaning we can transition from fossil fuels to emissions-free power generations quickly to help save our planet. Now, I'd hope that this motion will be the last time a member of the Liberals and Nationals brings up nuclear, but I know it won't be. They've been talking about it since 1955. They're talking about it in 2023. It's just a continuation of denial, delay and dysfunction. And Australia's moved on. It's time to stop talking about nuclear. I thank the member. Uh, the question is that the motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Wide Bay. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy Speaker. And it uh, does give me uh, a deal of uh, pleasure to rise to speak on this motion, this private member's motion by the member for Lyon. We must remove federal and state bans so nuclear energy can deliver affordable energy security to a decarbonised electricity grid. Australia has been at the forefront of nuclear science and technology since the 1950s, when the Australian Atomic Energy Commission set up a research reactor at Lucas Heights in Sydney. Lucas Heights is one of only 70 reactors worldwide capable of producing life-saving medical radioisotopes. We have one of the world's leading safety authorities to oversee the operation of Australia's nuclear industries. Today, in Senate estimates, a top federal bureaucrat uh, needed help to answer questions about how Australia can achieve an uplift in transmission assets across the grid with the, use, uh, with the issues of rolling out thousands of kilometres of lines, especially to remote solar and wind farms on communities that struggle with towers on, on their properties. Most decarbonisation scenarios show accelerating renewables deployment over time uh, access to the thousands of sites needed for renewables will become increasingly difficult as the best sites are developed first. Australia's leading systems engineers came to the parliament and warned us that as the arms race to renewable renewables takes off, land for lower capacity sites will become more expensive and difficult to find. The energy they provide is intermittent, so we will have to import new community batteries every 15 years. Yet, environmental department heads today could not give assurances that they will be able, there will be enough batteries to sustain an 82 per cent renewable grid. Our 2050 policy 
says everything from our cars, buses, planes to uh, cement plants will be electric. We will need a 215% increase on the 200 terawatt hours of electricity we generate now. Nuclear is the only low emissions power generator that can operate reliably regardless of weather. It has worked for 33 nations in six continents for generations. Australia has one of the largest grids in the world. We, use, uh, we used to have the third cheapest power bills in the OECD. We are now the third most expensive in the OECD, with the spot price reaching record highs last week. Labor claims nuclear power is not cost effective. Why do more than 30 countries in the world rely on nuclear with power more affordable than ours? Engineers warn us that the total 60-year nominal capital cost of a renewable net zero option, including hydro, solar, wind and batteries, stands at over $1.2 trillion. The total 60-year nominal cost of nuclear power stations is less than half that, uh, at $594 billion. Nuclear is cheaper than renewables. It's uh, familiar to Australia. It's already on submarines that come to our harbours. It's already in Sydney. This Labor government prefers scaremongering to listening to experts. It seems to think if we build lots and lots of winds and solar, power will become as cheap as possible, but that is not the reality of things. These resources cannot match the demand of the grid, which must be met by reliable supply every second of the day and night. We instead will, need, will be left with an extremely expensive, highly volatile power system. Nuclear technology options are being manufactured uh, to create reliable baseload power in Canada and in the United States. We just need them here. The perfect site for our nuclear uh, power stations is our old coal-fired power stations, just as they are, uh, are retrofitted in the United Kingdom. The existing steam turbine generators from old coal-fired uh, power stations and their electrical distribution system can provide nuclear power to the grid without any significant modification, saving the pain and cost of building transmission lines for renewable renewables which threaten to carve up parts of Wide Bay. This is the only way we can reach net zero by 2050. Thank you. The motion is the question rather is that the motion be agreed to. Is the member for New England seeking a call? Well thank you very much uh, Madam Deputy President. I'd like to uh, Deputy Speaker I'm back in the Senate. Um, first of all I'd like to commend the member for line for He's championing this issue. I think it's incredibly important that we clearly understand that the world is changing and Australia is going to get left behind again, again. The technology is racing ahead. We want smart manufacturing, well-paid manufacturing jobs. And we're missing out on this opportunity because of this sort of dark ages mentality. We live in this quasi belief that all the other countries that are developing small modular reactors are somehow um, dumber than us. All these dumb countries, dumb countries like the United Kingdom, like France, like uh, Scandinavia, Sweden, like Czechoslovakia, like Argentina, like Canada, like the United States, like Russia, like China, um, and we don't know completely what their purposes are, like Japan. We had the ambassador from Japan in merely, yes, or oh, merely last sitting day in Parliament. And we posed the question to them about where they are with nuclear, because we all hear about Fukushima, and they said, look, the issue we have is that Fukushima could have stood up to, uh, to earthquakes, but it couldn't stand up to a tidal wave. Now, we have to get on the records that the, peop the fatalities from the Fukushima nuclear disaster was zero. No one died in the Fukushima nuclear disaster from the nuclear disaster. Now, but that's not a small modular reactor. They're large reactors. And we should be on, on board with making sure that we avail ourselves with the opportunities, the hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars that is coming forward in this new industry. Madam Deputy Speaker, I was uh, not amazed, but I think it's, it has to be quite clear. The Australian people's concern about us getting nuclear submarines has been overwhelmingly non-evident. People don't care. 
Now, what happens if one of these nuclear submarines comes into our port and turns on our light? Do we insist that they turn it off because that's nuclear power lighting up our dock? What happens if someone rounds an extension cord down to, uh, I don't know, to, to dr drill a screw in on the, on the port or do something away from the nuclear submarine? Are we going to ban it? It's archaic where we've ended up right now. We've got to understand that if, if we are going to try and hit zero emissions, then we are going to need sustainable baseload power. Now, we've seen what the costs are of Snowy Hydro 2.0. They're heading north of $10 billion. Renewables are incredibly expensive when you compare apples with apples. That is 24-7 dispatchable because they need the cost of pump hydro, which is massive, or they need the cost of batteries, which is massive. And currently, the battery technology has got no hope of delivering sustainable baseload power. The quote we got in this building of how much it would cost for a battery backup for 24-7 sustainable power was $5 trillion. We don't have that money. So we have got to be smart and work around it. Now, not only are they developing small modular reactors, we're also in the process in Australia, such as Professor Marco developing micro reactors up to 50 megawatts. These are going to end up on Pacific Islands, they're going to be all around the world, and what are we going to sit back here and say, oh, well, like, we don't believe in them? It's like saying you don't believe in mobile phones or fridges or, or colour televisions. It's coming. And the smartest thing for us to do in this nation is get on board. In the coming months, they are going to blow up, blow up, Liddell Power Station. That means they're not going to dismantle it, they're going to blow it up. And here is the place with all the transmission lines in, with all the connections in, and it would be the ideal spot for us to work towards having small modular actors. Put it to the people of Musselbrook. Tell them that their jobs stay, that everything continues on. Tell them about exactly where the technology is. Um, I want to note it on the record that we support small modular reactors, so in the, in the future, when we get them, and they will turn up, we can re refer back to this as those who were trying to make sure that Australia was on the front foot. If not, we continue on with this ridiculous process of the massive footprint of such things as, as, as wind turbines which are disliked intensely in regional areas because of the transmission lines, the footprint, the social uh, dis, uh, um, upset it causes. And once small modular reactors come in, and they will, they'll all be out of date. They'll all be out of date. So um, I support this. I clearly put down my support of it. And I tell you what, if you want to see a fight, come out to regional areas and see the fight we're having over wind towers. So the question is that the motion be agreed to. I give the call to the member for Pearce. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I rise to speak in response to the motion of the member for Lyme regarding nuclear energy. First, a question. Who wants a nuclear reactor in their electorate? I know I don't. And I strongly believe that sentiment will be echoed and supported by communities in my electorate of Pearce. To be able to provide power on a scale needed under the coalition's nuclear energy plan, we would need to build 80 small-scale nuclear reactors around Australia. 80. That would amount to a cost of 402 billion, or 17% of GDP, which is 30 times more than the government spent last year on transport and communications, and over 10 times more than the amount spent on defence. Nuclear energy has been looked into numerous times in inquiry after inquiry, including the Switzkowski report, which stated that nuclear reactors would need to be built close to population centres. Across the world, energy prices are rising as a result of Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. This is wreaking havoc on energy markets around the globe and pushing up electricity prices in Australia. Yet the Liberals and Nationals' answer is to have a chat about nuclear energy. Let me remind all that during the nine years of a Liberal National Government, we had 22 stop-start energy policies. Australians are feeling the crunch, and yet Peter Dutton's solution is to look at the most expensive 
and slowest to implement energy. The CSIRO Member, has written numerous please, reports. Sorry to interrupt, but you need to refer to members by their proper titles. My apologies. My apologies. The CSIRO has written numerous reports that found the cost of nuclear energy will be the most expensive energy for Australia. The CSIRO GenCos 2021-2022 final report estimates that electricity produced by nuclear energy using small modular reactors, or SMRs, would likely be approximately two to five times more expensive than electricity produced by renewables. To achieve the lower end of this range would require SMRs to be deployed globally in large enough numbers to bring down costs available to Australia. Even the nuclear energy industry itself admits the cost is a prohibitive factor compared with renewable energy. Clearly, the better option is to invest in renewables. The CSIRO's 2021 GenCos report confirms past year's findings that wind and solar are the cheapest source of electricity generation and storage in Australia. Nuclear power plants, creative re re radioactive waste, plain and simple. We need to remember that management of nuclear and radioactive waste has been a continuing issue in Australia, and we do not currently have a permanent disposable facility for radioactive waste. Previous governments have been searching for an appropriate location for approximately four decades. I ask, what is the opposition's plan to deal with the massive amounts of radioactive material that will be generated from 80 SMRs around Australia? And once you figure out where it's going to be disposed or stored, you then need to contemplate how it will be transported there. The likely scenario is on a truck. Dozens of trucks carry nuclear radioactive waste across the country, collecting and depositing spent nuclear fuel rods. A recent incident in my home state of Western Australia caused worry and fear in the community when a tiny radioactive capsule was lost in transit. It is understood to have fallen off a truck. The emergency response was far from understated. Six days across 1,400 kilometres of highway with specialist teams using radiation detective equipment. Fortunately, it was found, but it could have been worse. We need to consider what Australians want and many fear nuclear power because of safety concerns. In 2010 and 2012, an Australia-wide survey assessed Australians' attitude to nuclear power. And while Australians believe nuclear power offers a clean and more efficient option to coal, they were against nuclear power due to safety concerns and distrust. Deputy Speaker, we are here to listen to our communities. Thank you. Thank you. So the question is the motion be agreed to, and I give the call to the member for Longman. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Like most Australians, I've been keeping a very interested eye on the energy space in our country and indeed globally over the last 15 years or so. This was long before I was in politics because energy is so crucial to our modern society. As a small business owner, we need reliable, affordable power. As a father and a grandfather, I want energy that is environmentally friendly as possible to ensure my children and grandchildren have a healthy planet to live on well into the future. As a Liberal and therefore someone who believes in personal responsibility, I'm very much in the camp that believes it is not only the government's responsibility to do their bit, but it is also the responsibility of business and every individual to play their part in getting the energy mix right, ensuring that all three components of the energy mix are met, reliability, affordability and environment. Deputy Speaker, everything in life is about balance, and energy supply is no different. Renewables have their benefits and their place in the energy mix, but realistically only as a supplement to a good baseload power source. Little is spoken about the detriments of renewable energy, as many people see it as the saviour of the world. Yet many, in, many of the people in my electorate Longman ask questions like, where is the discussion around landfill when solar panels, wind towers and batteries reach end of life? Are we going to have cleaner air but dirtier soil and waterways? Where is the discussion about the volatility of lithium and its propensity to suddenly catch fire as we either sit on top of it as we drive EVs in the future or have it downstairs in battery storage as we sleep in our homes? What about the fact that we will need ugly solar and wind farms over three times the size of Tasmania to meet our baseload energy needs, not to mention that it, the harm that it causes the environment by killing birds and clearing usable land. 
No, there is no discussion of any of this. That is simply ridiculous as we navigate our way through this energy transition stage. Not to mention the affordability issue as we know that EVs are simply going to be out of the reach of the Aussie battler. Deputy Speaker, at this critical time, we must look to other countries who have experimented with different types of energy and learn from their mistakes and adopt their successes. Nuclear energy has long been a taboo subject in this country because of events such as Chernobyl, Fukushima and various other reasons. Mm. But as often happens with new technologies, they develop and improve over time, which is exactly what has happened with nuclear energy. I recently had the privilege of, privilege of being part of a delegation to Taiwan who have had nuclear power for many years and are now closing their reactors down. I asked them, why are you shutting down the nuclear energy in your country? As it, is it unreliable? Is it too expensive? The reply was, no, it is purely political, as we have many earthquakes in our country and people are concerned about the safety side. I then said, so will renewable energy you are replacing the nuclear with be as affordable and reliable? To which I was given the reply, no, we accept that there will be brownouts at times and that energy will be more expensive. Pressing further, I asked, so if you were in Australia, would you have nuclear energy? The reply was one word, absolutely. After much research and discussions, and from what I now understand about nuclear energy, I believe it very much needs to be part of the discussion for Australia's future energy supply. The benefits of the reliability and long-term affordability and the fact that it is very much considered a form of green energy hold nuclear in good stead. Other benefits include it can utilise the existing grid and coal-fired power station sites, which will save money on new infrastructure. This, along with Australia's stable land mass and our abundance of uranium, coupled with the now very safe small modular reactors, have led me to this conclusion. Deputy Speaker, I am a layman with no expertise in the energy sector. However, my desire is to have a balanced, pragmatic discussion around energy supply in this country with all energy types on the table. This discussion and research need to be, needs to be carried out by stakeholders who have no financial benefit or preconceived bias about any type of energy production, devoid of emotion and based purely on facts, with all aspects and cohorts of society considered in the discussion. The entire life cycle of all energy gener generation types that considers reliability, affordability, environmental impacts, initial setup costs, disposal of waste at end of life and refining, refining costs all need to be considered, including nuclear energy. Deputy Speaker, if this government is serious about energy in this country, then they will include nuclear in the discussion as we're the only G20 nation that doesn't have nuclear energy. The question is the motion be agreed to. I give the call to the member for Hughes. Deputy Speaker, I rise to, put, to speak on this motion put by the member for Lyon. I am advocating for us as a country to investigate how we utilise the nuclear expertise, technologies and scientists already in our country to investigate whether nuclear energy has a viable role to play in our country to assist as we transition to a decarbonised economy. I note that many in the government have extolled the, virtu vir the virtues of renewable energy technologies. But, Deputy Speaker, they are not mutually exclusive. I also support renewables. Why is it, though, that we cannot look at both options? The electorate of Hughes punches well above its weight in many areas. I am particularly proud that Hughes is the home of Australia's nuclear science and technology organisation, known as ANSTO, and located in Lucas Heights. It has rightly been said in this motion that Australia has been at the forefront of nuclear science and technology since 1953, when the reactors were first established. ANSTO operates much of Australia's landmark infrastructure for nuclear science, research, innovation and technology. It contains the Open Pool Australian Light, or OPAL, water reactor that is designed to produce neutrons used in research and to promote radioisotopes. It is the only nuclear research reactor in Australia and also one of the world's most modern. The ANSTO staff have showcased the facility to me on a number of occasions. ANSTO has its mission statement to deliver knowledge, value and trust through the application of nuclear science, technology and engineering. It has three main priority areas. They are in health, environment and nuclear technologies. In terms of health, 
Its most important research areas are in both human health and also in the biosciences. Human health researchers have expertise in the design and optimisation of treatment tools and methods using nuclear technologies, the modelling of complex radiation physics and the use of nuclear techniques for understanding the neurophysiology of the brain. The Biosciences Group at ANSTO is focused on the development and translation of radiopharmaceuticals to improve the detection and diagnosis of disease. ANSTO has the expertise and capabilities to supply radioisotopes and undertake radiochemistry, radiation biology, as well as preclinical imaging studies. This work has particularly been invaluable for Australia's cancer patients. Within the environment priorities, ANSTO conducts and enables interdisciplinary research using nuclear and isotopic techniques to address some of Australia's and indeed the world's most challenging environmental problems. It has a primary focus on water resource sustainability, an issue which is integral to Australia. Using their capabilities in isotoping tracing analysis, ANSTO scientists provide water resource managers with information on water quality and the sustainability of groundwater resources and aquatic ecosystems. Nuclear technologies are also fundamental to ANSTO's work. Their researchers address key scientific questions related to both the current generation of nuclear reactors and also future systems. Particularly, ANSTO researchers are investigating the key properties of nuclear waste to improve safety for both short and long-term storage. ANSTO's education team offers a wide variety of learning resources that align with the New South Wales curriculum, as well as providing education into science, nuclear technology and sustainability. Deputy Speaker, in my first speech in this place, I said that with the significant environment and climate change issues that we face in Australia, combined with the energy crisis, I'm committed to approaching how we can utilise the nuclear technology and innovation at ANSTO to answer our energy questions. My 15-year-old self, who had posters of Midnight Oil throughout her bedroom, would shudder at this speech. However, the nuclear energy of 2022 is very different, of 23, sorry, is very different to that of the past. And I saw this most recently at COP27 in Egypt. Deputy Speaker, as Australia transitions to a decarbonised electricity grid, it makes no sense to cling to old attitudes towards nuclear, to stubbornly refuse to even investigate the possibility of nuclear energy. In all of these circumstances, I commend this motion to the House. Thank you. And the time allotted for this debate has, um, well, sorry, no, there being no further speakers, the debate has uh, adjourned and the resumption of the debate will be made an order of the day for the next sitting. And I give the call to the member for Pearce. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I move that the Federation Chamber do now adjourn. Member for Indo. Uh, so the question is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. And the Federation Chamber will now stand adjourned until 4 p.m. tomorrow, and that is Thursday, the 14th of Tuesday, not Thursday. Gosh, getting way ahead of myself. Uh, Tuesday, the 14th of February. Possibly significant for some people this date, but for us, it's the Fed Chamber resuming. Thank you. <laughs>